John Garcia, welcome back to T-Town. I hope all is well, man. Doing well, Ryan. It's that time of year where it's pretty busy, but it's always fun in between. Yeah, and John, I'm going to get caught up on a lot of different things, but uh, maybe just give us some overall feeling of how this season ended, uh, going 13-0 and and making it once again in the college football playoffs. So just some general thoughts about this football team. Uh, yeah, just it's remarkable. You know, when you think of, of the roster overhaul, the staff overhaul, which, you know, is, I guess being tweaked again uh, now as, as per usual, uh, it's just remarkable to have the type of consistency that Alabama has despite all of the trends and changes that, that go on in, in this great game. And obviously looking at this team, you, you got to start with the offense and Tua and the passing game and just how quickly Alabama became – for better or worse, a, a pass-first team for a large majority of, of this, this season. And, and fans adjusted very quickly. Uh, surprised me to some degree um, uh, just how much Bama was willing to throw it. But, you know, you got to adjust with what you got. And, and that offense with that great offensive line and all of those weapons was just um, – it was tailor-made for spreading it around. And Bama did that very, very well. Um, and, and at times it, it still looked like a throwback attack with – with the amount of running backs and, uh, and power there in the backfield. But, um, you know, defensively, a lot of guys stepped up. A lot of guys took the next step. You know, Quinton Williams, Deontay Thompson, those guys had unbelievable years. But I thought the supporting cast around them was, was just as good. And kind of, I think even still, Ryan, been a bit of a lost storyline, just how good the defense was down the stretch and how good some unproven players and young players showed up. Uh, towards the end of the year. I mean, he started a freshman corner basically all year, and there was never a, oh, that's a freshman mistake type of play. You never really said it or thought it. And that's, uh, uh, again, another indication of, of just how well this team recruits and just how well this team reloads year in, year out. Um, and then you, you got the in-between as well, right? You got the, the intangible, the, the grit, the toughness, uh, the, the stick to of, of the backups, Jalen Hurts, became the story towards the end of the year. and The whole thing against Georgia goes full circle. and You really had a, an element of everything uh, for Alabama through 13 games, taking everybody's best shot and, and coming out, uh, you know, number one when it counts most. So we'll see uh, We'll see what the rest of this month entails before uh, the 29th. John, and you brought it up, and I've, I've tried to say it, but I've, I've kind of struggled. But someone who played college defensive back, uh, defensive back at the college level, I think would be a better way to say that, John Garcia here with us. Uh, you look back at Carl Scott. I don't know if we give him enough credit for what he's done as a coaching staff, uh, maybe the, the MVP of the coaching staff. Mike Loxley is certainly right there with him. Uh, but when you step back and you look at what he had to work with, uh, no starters returning in that secondary. And as you highlighted there, I think a lot of credit goes to Carl Scott. It should. Yeah, the, the cornerback play at Alabama against the pass was, was borderline phenomenal all year. Um, some of the, the conventional things that offenses would try against Alabama, because you knew you were going to get man coverage, you know, you would try to isolate those 50-50 plays and take advantage of a lot of times corners who looked panicked or, or lack length or ball skills, even under Nick Saban. And we've seen some of these NFL corners that played at Alabama look really panicked as, as young players, um, whether it's Marlon Humphrey, Tony Brown, Eddie Jackson even, um, you know, kind of exposed at times as, as young guys playing. But, you know, Patrick Sertain, Savion Smith, Javon Diggs before he got hurt, I mean, this was as comfortable – um, a, a cornerback group in terms of ball skills and, 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 and at those times when we see tugging and pulling and flags or, or you know, not turning your head in time, the little things, this is as complete a group and as calm a group and confident as, as I've seen at Alabama. And obviously that, that is saying a ton about the detail from Nick Saban down to Carl Scott. Uh, and you're starting to see recruiting returns, by the way, for, for Bama fans who don't follow recruiting. He's He's turning that into uh, his season into a big recruiting finish in the secondary. But I thought that was the biggest difference between this group and, and the last few years. There was just no – there was always that guy that if the ball was in the air and, and you saw the opposing quarterback throwing it deep, that Alabama fans would kind of wince, like, oh, no, it's going that way. And you, you didn't really have that all year in, in an era where – or in a season where you're up every single game. So every opponent is, is – desperate for that type. 
type of matchup, desperate for that type of, of player to take advantage of, and it never really revealed itself. Um, like we said preseason, Savion Smith was probably the one who took the most risk, but it wasn't because he wasn't confident or, or calm. It was because he was trying to make a play uh, maybe sometimes you know, that wasn't there, similar to Tua uh, on offense a little bit at times. So um, you'd rather have that than the guy who's getting the laundry um, dealt every single time, and I think that that is the biggest credit to Carl Scott. Uh, the attention to detail, the basic technique, and the consistency at maybe the hardest position of, of a defense I thought was – just an unbelievable storyline all year for Alabama, and um, obviously they're going to need that uh, against the, the reigning Heisman winner uh, several several weeks from now. We're certainly going to talk about the positive, but let me also hit the negative. What happened with Clay Webb? <laughs> uh, you know, Clay Clay's a different cat. I think everybody would tell you that, not in a bad way, but but he was going to handle things differently, and he did all the way through the ending, and not to coming to, to the in-state pressure. I don't think it was anything Alabama did wrong. I think uh, an early camp at Georgia with Sam Pittman uh, kind of showed him something different on the field than he got anywhere else. Uh, and I think you look at the kind of offensive linemen that Georgia's been able to bring in, uh, five stars in several different states plucking away great talent, that's just you know the, where, where the conversation begins right now when it comes to offensive line recruiters in the country. Um, educationally, I thought there was there was some factor there with, with the engineering programs at the respective schools, things like that. But um, this was basically Georgia's race to lose for, for quite a while. Uh, we don't know exactly how long, and we didn't assume as much because the number one player in the state has never left two years in a row, literally, until now. So um, a lot of the assumed uh, recruiting storylines with Clay were, were, were just that assumption. And I think um, – it was really Georgia's race to lose for, for quite a while. We just didn't realize it as much until this this final stretch, and it was actually Alabama looking to make up ground there at the very end. It did, and, and did vault Auburn and Clemson to finish second, but obviously uh, second in recruiting this time of year doesn't really do you a whole lot. So uh, you credit Sam Pittman, which was the first thing Clay said after he decided yesterday. He said Sam Pittman, that's the main reason that – he wanted to go to Georgia, so you, you give credit where it's due there, and um, you look to move on. Luckily for Bama, uh, still multiple five-star offensive linemen on the board that are uncommitted. Evan Neal's the guy who's probably the most likely to, to join the Crimson Tide there. Uh, Georgia hosted him this past weekend, um, so the, obviously the Bulldogs are going to be um, at play here. And, and that's what we said, Ryan, I'm sure when I came on your show after Kirby Smart was hired, I'm sure that's what I, what I said. Hey, this is going to be the primary – recruiting rival for years to come and I think we're, we're seeing that play out Johnny is there somebody out there that you look at that could also be that fill in that stop gap for center because Alabama certainly needs one of those guys that and I'm sure they've, they've got some guys that can rotate in that position uh, but I, I think they kind of opened it up with Ross Pierce Becker leaving uh, that Clay Webb could be that guy is there somebody out there that you think uh, could handle that responsibility, and I'm sure that's what Alabama's selling right now on the recruiting trail. You know, I, I don't know if there's a pure center there uh, in this class in terms of guys who are remaining. Now, some of these verbal commits Alabama has on board have that type of long-term potential, but short-term it's, it's tough to imagine a guy not named Clay Webb uh, or Harry Miller the, the Georgia prospect who's headed off to Ohio State, and I believe sticking with Ohio State, um, those two were, were kind of the cream of the crop at, at center. Bama made a run at each, and, and it didn't work out. So in terms of a true freshman doing it, I don't really see an avenue there. I think a couple of commits could potentially end up there down the road. Pierce Quick, Darian Dalcourt, kid out of the DMV area, who I wonder if Mike Loxley is going to try to re-recruit towards Maryland. Uh, but I don't think in the short term there's a guy there. Now, Last year's class, uh, you flipped one from Michigan, who I think has the ability to potentially play early. Emil Echior, uh, a guy who, who came up as a center, which is rare. Uh, Clay Webb has rarely played center, uh, actually, despite the projection. Uh, this kid actually came up as one, Emil Echior, who's a freshman right now at Alabama. Um, without having intimate details of the progress of the O-line this year in terms of guys on campus, I'd say that he, uh, at least with his pedigree, uh, is the most well-positioned to, to, to be the leading candidate uh, for 
that open vacancy uh, aside from, like you said, uh, an experienced guy sliding down to center like we saw this year with Pierce Buck. John, when you look at this offensive explosion here in Tuscaloosa with Tua and the direction that they're wanting to go, and it's a fun offense to play in, how much has that helped on recruiting? Oh, it's immense. It's immense. I mean, uh, every single offensive position, uh, you've seen a boost. Offensive linemen want to play in a system like that. Um, Running backs want to, you know, running backs are so conscious now. It's really really cool to see and something that probably doesn't get enough attention. These high school running backs are so um, into splitting carries, catching passes out of the backfield because they watch Sunday football and they watch Alvin Kamara and they watch, you know, I was going to say Kareem Hunt, but I guess not anymore. They watch these versatile running backs catch passes and they say, man, we want to do that. So an offense that is pass first and still utilizes that running back is so much more conducive to what they want in their, in their football goals. So, that helps the running back position, and obviously wide receiver, tight end. I mean, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer helper. And then you've seen Alabama involved with uh, the cream of the crop tight ends in this class. Has one committed in Jaleel Billingsley. Already has one committed in 2020, which you know I don't remember the last time Alabama had an early uh, two years out tight end commitment. But but again, Irv Smith has his breakout uh, due to to the, to the opening of the offense, and, and you're seeing dividends there with pass catching type tight end as well so every receiving type of position is going to be boosted but the irony I guess is that you know quarterback Bama wanted to take two and has its two legacies locked in in Tango Vailoa and Paul Tyson but um, receiver was really not a priority this class for Alabama Um, they could still add one or two down the stretch and if they do you know Auburn commitment George Pickens is one that I would I would focus in on but the number was never going to be high Um, in 2020 that will change and they've already got multiple 2020 receivers committed, high school juniors. But in this class, it wasn't as much of a priority. So more tangible momentum with, with the quarterbacks and, and the offense opening up and, and uh, linemen and pass catchers, not not wide receivers, uh, essentially. Though there is one committed in John Mechie, who I believe is enrolling in the next week or so um, at Alabama. Another new trend that Nick Saban has, has, has begun. And um, as of Clay Webb yesterday enrolling early at Georgia, that's going to be a, another one that everybody uh, begins to follow Nick's lead on. And uh, kids are going to get there earlier and earlier uh, once again because of uh, the Nick Saban philosophy. It's available at crimsonandbluechips.com, crimsonandbluechips.com. It's the podcast available, Crimson Tide coverage, and so much more. John Garcia, find him on the Twitter account, but also connect with him at Crimson and Blue Chips Podcast. C-A-B-C pod, and then also on crimsonandbluechips.com. John, the website looks great, man. Yeah, our guys, uh, you know, our team is, is, is growing over there. Um, you know, so I, I let them borrow the old name, and there's some some guys who, who just love ball are going to talk about it a little bit more over there. But, of course, it is the same name of the podcast, and we'll, we'll definitely still uh, hold down that end of the fort, no doubt. Thank you so much, John. I hope you have a great day. You as well, Ryan. Thanks for having me.